The following program is sponsored by Community Psychiatric Centers and is produced for educational purposes only. It is not intended as a substitute for medical or psychological advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The content should not be used for self-diagnosis or treatment of any health-related condition. As always, seek the advice of your health care provider with any questions regarding a medical or mental health condition. Welcome to Community Psychiatric Centers Presents. Tonight we're talking about toilet training for tots, what works, what doesn't, and what you as a parent can do if your child is having problems. But first, let's meet our experts. Dr. John Carrasso is Clinical Director of Community Psychiatric Centers. He's a clinical licensed child psychologist and a certified school psychologist. And Dr. Robert Lowenstein is Medical Director of Community Psychiatric Centers. He's a board certified child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist, and a fellow of the American American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Dr. Lowenstein, toilet training their child is obviously a milestone that parents look forward to, but as we know, it doesn't always go so well. What are some of the common problems? Right. Well, <clears throat> parents can take some comfort in knowing that toilet training goes relatively well for most children. Probably uh, 80 to 90 percent of children achieve it without much trouble and a few percentage of those uh, don't. Typically, children are toilet trained by the age of three and a half or four, and the process takes about eight months to complete in some children. Now, there are some children that achieve it within one month or two months, and others where it takes longer. So parents need to take comfort in the fact that every child is different, and they will definitely learn how to do it sooner or later. Um, every child is different, so we have to approach that child as a different child. The kinds of things which can uh, make the process go a little bit longer are that firstly the child is simply not ready, not developmentally ready to achieve that task and they perhaps need some time in order to develop, in order to be able to do that. Secondarily, parents may not be consistently applying toilet training techniques in a way that allows a child to learn it and that's some of the things we can talk about today to help parents to consistently apply those techniques that are needed to learn that task. And some children are simply afraid of the process, afraid of the toilet, afraid of its size, the sound, uh, afraid of maybe they're going to fall in or something of that sort. We hear that a lot. Afraid of the sound of the flushing. And so perhaps some of those fears also do need to be addressed. And also there are some things that happen in a child's life which can interfere with the routine that they need to develop in order to become toilet trained. For example, they may move to a new home. There may be the birth of a new sibling. Parents may become separated or divorced. There are all kinds of traumatic or uh, transitions that a child has to um, develop uh, um, in order to be able to achieve this developmental goal. And if something happens to interfere with that, it'll take a little bit longer. Dr. Cross, how does a parent know when a child is ready to start the process of toilet training? Sure. Because as Dr. Lowenstein said, every child is different. Yeah, there are a few signs parents can look for, but one thing to take note of, uh, Dr. Lowenstein mentioned that most kids are totally trained by three and a half to four years of age. You know, some, some, we have a mentality at times to think that toilet training is supposed to start at two and be done shortly thereafter. And that's just not, that's just not accurate. And so things that parents need, need to be looking for is first and foremost, the, the ability and willingness to communicate that the child, the, the child is wet or soiled and that they want to be changed. Uh, they need to demonstrate some sense of, of control, uh, preferably so that they can stay dry for upwards of two hours or stay dry after a nap. That they can uh, and are willing to follow simple directions. Uh, they, they need, it, it, that's always helpful because again, the goal is it's not just being toilet trained, but being toilet trained with increased independence so they can walk to the bathroom. Uh, they can uh, negotiate uh, clips or whatever the case may be to, to um, be able to undress themselves and, and, and use the toilet. Also, it's helpful if they want to wear big girl or big boy underwear. That's always helpful as well if they actually want to do that. And typically, when you start making that transition from diapers to underwear, you'll see that. You'll see that tremendous interest where that they want that. And they won't want to go back to diapers at times. Uh, and that can be, that, that's a positive sign. 
Dr. Lowenstein, how does a parent get started mm -hmm. with toilet training? Right. Well, the first thing that a parent has to do is to rule out the presence of an organic cause for problem with toilet training. So we typically will look to see whether the child has a kidney or a bladder problem or uh, a problem with their colon, and which might prevent them uh, from achieving this uh, successfully. It also uh, seems to occur in conjunction with certain sleep disorders which need to be ruled out. Once all of the medical causes for these problems are ruled out, then the parent can start the process of trying to toilet train their child. The first step, of course, is to, once the child shows a readiness for it, the first step is to prepare for the process. So the parent has to go out and buy the appliances that are needed to teach this task. Some parents like to buy a portable potty, which uh, the child can sit on. It's stable, it's sturdy, and they sit right on it. and It's awfully comfortable. It can be placed anywhere in the home. Other times, uh, also, the parent may buy some books, which they can read to the child, learn the child's um, uh, schedule, learn when the child is about ready to go to the bathroom, when they need to urinate. Typically, this happens at certain times in the day. And maybe teach the child certain words that they can use in order to tell the parent that they're ready to go to the bathroom. Once uh, this preparation is completed, then you go out and you actually buy the potty uh, uh, seat or uh, buy the other appliances which the child then can use in order um, to be toilet trained. Sometimes there are certain appliances which are fit onto the existing toilet which the child can use, but that requires usually a step of some kind in order that for a small child to go up onto the seat. This is a little bit more complicated, a little more difficult, but certainly can be done. Dr. Grosso, what are some of the other considerations for parents uh, regarding the start of toilet training for their kids? One of the challenges parents face is that there are so many considerations. There really are. That's a decision making that goes into this. Things that you wouldn't think would be much of a, of a uh, dilemma it can be. Uh, for example, even moving from diapers to underwear, uh, the logical progression one would think would be moving from diapers to pull-ups to underwear. Um, s m many parents, though, choose to forego pull-ups, finding them to be rather cumbersome, uh, and actually they can, ironically, can be rather difficult to pull off, and they really can be. And that's where it defeats the purpose, because the idea of pull-ups is to, is to uh, provide protection while at the same time teaching children the whole idea of pulling up and, and the various motions to, in order to take care of that process. But again, uh, Parents, sometimes parents find it just easier just to use diapers. The challenge, though, is that as you buy larger and larger diapers, they become more and more expensive. So there's clearly a financial motivation for parents to, to get their kids off of diapers and into underwear. Um, fortunately, though, again, as, as I mentioned before, uh, not uncommonly, when you make that first step from diapers to underwear, um, the child doesn't want to go back, which also, also can cause some challenges as well because then you're, you're fighting with the child to get them to wear their diaper during times when they need to be, which is, for example, during naps, during bedtime, uh, taking long car rides or long trips during the day. You may, we may, may choose to have more protection during those times. But again, that, it's a positive sign if they want to stay in their underwear for as long, and, and that's, that, that, that's a sign of, of progress. All right, we're going to take a short break. You're watching Community Psychiatric Centers Presents on PCNC. If you have a question for our doctors, you can always give them a call at 1-877-899-6500 or log on to their website at cpcwecare.com. Stay with us. Is your child defiant at home? Do teachers say your child refuses to behave? If this sounds familiar and your family is in crisis, we can help. I'm Dr. Robert Lowenstein. And I'm Dr. John Carrasso. At Community Psychiatric Centers, we make it our mission to quickly and effectively diagnose and treat your child so your family doesn't have to spend months on a waiting list. Call us today for a free phone consultation. An early diagnosis and proper treatment can make a world of difference in your child's life. From where I was sitting as a U.S. Army soldier, I knew I had to go where I was told, when I was told. From where my family was sitting, they knew I had to go too. I also knew that while most soldiers physically come home from war, some never return emotionally. The challenges of healing and the visible wounds of war can be a daily struggle. But help is available through the National Veterans Foundation Lifeline, dedicated to helping veterans and their families find solutions. Time may not heal all wounds, but from where I'm sitting today, I know the National Veterans Foundation can help.
Welcome back to Community Psychiatric Centers Presents. We're talking with Drs. Robert Lowenstein and Dr. John Carrasso about toilet training for TOTS tonight. And Dr. Lowenstein, what about potty seats? Should they be used and are they better than the, uh, is it better to use the standalone potty chairs that you were talking yeah. about or put that attachment on yeah. that you also mentioned? Well, the pros and cons to both, actually. Uh, the standalone are just small chairs with uh, with a pot underneath it which then can be uh, uh, cleaned out and uh, they're more stable and they're easier for child to use because they sit on the floor and the child is more comfortable on that uh, small seat. I think children tend to prepare to prefer that a lot. Some of these seats come with uh, uh, tunes that they play or <laughs> chairs featuring cartoon characters on them or they fold up. Some fold up and can be carried so they can be very um, accessible and quite easy to use. The other chairs that uh, um, are uh, 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 a seat is fitted onto the regular toilet are also quite useful and comfortable. They require a step, as I mentioned before, upwards to the uh, toilet. The pros to that is that the child does get used to the flushing uh, of um, uh, of the material and uh, it's easier to transition from that to the real toilet as a next step. So there are pros and cons to both and parents just have to decide which one would be better for their child. Dr. Rosso, when's it uh, best to start toilet training and what tips do you have uh, about the types of clothes mm -hmm. that children should be wearing? That's something most people wouldn't think about. No, but no. Some it makes a difference. Make it, easier. it does, it makes a difference. In terms of when, there really is no best time. It's, you know, as Dr. Lonsky mentioned at the outset, each child is different and you uh, take focus on those signs that we talked about the, at, the, at the, fr the first segment as to when a child is ready to move forward with toilet training. Some are going to be ready sometimes as young as two years of age to start the process. Some really won't show an interest and show an inclination toward wanting to be changed or that they're you know, communicating that their diaper is swollen or whatever until you know, three, three and a half. It just it varies. Is one right or wrong? It's just it is what it is and parents need to accept that and have fun with it and just uh, let it progress at its natural progression. Now uh, in, in terms of uh, whether it's better to try to start earlier or later, again uh, the, the research doesn't really speak to that. It just speaks to the idea of starting when the child is ready to do so. There is somewhat of a sense that girls tend to master this quicker than guys do. But girls tend to master this about everything quicker than guys do developmentally, it seems. Um, in terms of what to wear, keeping in mind, the goal, the ultimate goal is independence. And so we want this to be an easy process for the child. We don't want it to be intimidating. So if they're wearing layers and wearing buttons and they're wearing suspenders and things that they are not accustomed to or accustomed to working with, well then that just makes it more intimidating and slows down the progress of it. Uh, so they may be resistant, not because they don't want to avoid in the toilet, but because they don't want to mess with their, their buttons or whatever the case may be. So less is best in terms of uh, as few clothes as possible easy clothes uh, when when children, when, when a parent purchases for, for their child a new outfit, they may want to practice with them. Okay, here's how you get these pants off. Here's how you take care of this shirt. Um, just getting it out of the way and whatnot. Um, always best to be prepared as well for parents to bring an extra set of clothing too. Summer is helpful in that respect in terms of typically kids wear less clothes during the summer and shorts and whatnot. So, so they're easier to get off, easier for, for kids, and the easier it is for them, the easier it will be for their parents, that's for sure. Yeah. Dr. Lowenstein, what happens if a child is resistant right. to uh, toilet training? Well, I think uh, the time that parents tend to worry or should worry the most is when a child has achieved the toilet training and then they regress. They've achieved the skill and then something happens in their child's life to cause them to regress and they then start to have uh, the accidents uh, at that point in time. At that time, sometimes these children are brought in for evaluations just because of that reason. The, the child has been toilet trained and now they're no longer toilet trained or they begin to soil or begin to smear feces and, and cause trouble at home. This is oftentimes an indication of other emotional problems which certainly need to be addressed and uh, treated sometimes. Furthermore, parents tend to put a lot of pressure on children to become totally trained sometimes and that's a battle that uh, becomes quite difficult for the child and for the parent alike and so when that stress is there, uh, then we try to help parents to back off a little bit and to be a little bit more calm about it. Now there are a lot of children who have special needs who also have trouble in being able to achieve this from the beginning. Children with autism or autism spectrum diagnoses often have trouble in their ability to learn to be totally trained because of sensory issues or because uh, 
of fears or because of problems with transitions, problems with taking off their clothing, problems with their ability to, to be able to associate the sensation of needing to go to the bathroom with actually going to the bathroom, which is really difficult to learn for some children or happens quite late for others. So these are the things which add to the resistance to achieving this uh, success. Let me ask either of you, is there a certain age by which parents should start to worry if a child isn't toilet trained? I mean, you said uh, every Most children different. learn it by the time they're teenagers. They certainly, <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> they don't go off to college that way. <laughs> So, but other than that, <laughs> other than that, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well put. <laughs> All right, we'll be back with some children's mental health issues in the news right after this. Stay with us. Every parent has sweet dreams for their baby, but what happens when the unexpected happens? When a child develops slowly, has trouble talking, or withdraws into a world all by himself? Today in America, an estimated one in every 150 children is diagnosed with autism. And while there is no known cause and no known cure, an early diagnosis can make a major difference in an autistic child's life. At Community Psychiatric Centers, Dr. John Carrasso and Dr. Robert Lowenstein have more than 50 combined years of experience diagnosing and treating many thousands of children and adolescents with autism spectrum disorders. They, along with their highly trained professional and caring staff, can evaluate, diagnose, and treat children and adolescents who may be having problems at home, in the community, or at school. If you believe your child needs help, call 1-877-899-6500 for an evaluation at one of our 11 convenient locations in southwestern Pennsylvania. Community Psychiatric Centers, connecting you, your community, your world, one family at a time. Welcome back to Community Psychiatric Centers Presents. We're talking with Dr. John Carrasso and Dr. Robert Lowenstein of Community Psychiatric Centers about a lot of children's health issues in the news. But before we uh, go into some other topical issues, we did want to talk about some openings you have right. at CPC because you have 11, still 11? That's centers? correct, yes. And uh, we certainly have a large uh, group of uh, staff who are professionals, who are skilled, and who we're very proud of. And, but we always have new openings, and we're always looking for new staff to join us uh, for a challenging and a rewarding job. We uh, hire uh, staff to be the behavior specialist consultants. Those require either a master's degree or a PhD with clinical expertise and experience in working with children and adolescents. Uh, also, people with master's degrees can work as uh, mobile therapists who go into homes and do uh, treatment uh, uh, therapy with children and their families in home and sometimes school settings, as well as therapeutic staff support staff, which are, who are a bachelor's trained people who work with children on a one-to-one -one in their homes or community uh, environments, sometimes in schools. Uh, it's a challenging job, it's rewarding, and it certainly uh, presents some people with a sharp learning curve uh, after they come to us. Staff is all trained and supervised and they learn quickly uh, how to better uh, um, help children. We also offer internships and practicums for people that are, or that are looking for that. And we're always looking for uh, administrative office staff, such as secretaries and supervisors that might uh, help us uh, in those settings. Uh, supervision is provided on a regular basis by myself and Dr. Carrasso. And um, if you're interested, just give us a call. All right, Very and nice. that number is 1-877-899-6500. And it's uh, right on screen. Also, you can log on to the website, that's cpcwecare.com. Okay, let's take a look at some of the uh, other topical issues that we have. Dr. Carrasso, <coughs> dyslexia and problems in the classroom. Very important topic. Uh, may, many of us have heard of, of dyslexia, but really having a firm understanding of what it is and how it presents, uh, most don't really fully understand it, and there's many misconceptions about it. Most people think of dyslexia, if they think of it at all, or have any, any understanding at all as a reading disorder. But it, it's much, much deeper than that, much broader than that. It's actually a language processing disorder uh, uh, covering all spheres of language, whether it be what we hear auditorily, reading abilities, written expression, even expanding into mathematics as well. It is actually a very common 
uh, disorder, as much as 20% uh, of, um, of the population is diagnosed with, can be diagnosed with dyslexia. Uh, so some research has suggested that. Of course, it does range from mild, moderate to severe. Uh, it's a highly inherited condition. Uh, there's some estimates that suggest if a parent has dyslexia, there's about a 50-50 chance that any given child that they have will have dyslexia as well. There is um, uh, a sense that a, a teacher or a parent can refer to a school uh, to have, the, to have the, the school district test for dyslexia. Well, keep in mind that that's really not, not entirely the case. Um, school districts test for a learning disability that may or may not incorporate uh, dyslexia. Th there really is not a test to the school district for dyslexia per se. Uh, and so it's important that parents seek out the proper uh, testing uh, the, the proper evaluator uh, to, to specifically assess for dyslexia. Many of the treatment strategies that we think of for teaching and helping to train in reading uh, really do not work well at all with dyslexia. Things such as uh, hooked on phonics and the various uh, reading centers in the community, uh, reading recovery and things of that nature uh, really are not effective with, with dyslexia because they start at a level um, uh, too high in a sense um, than where we need to start with people who have dyslexia. There, there are some fundamental skills that, that, that these individuals need to be taught before they can progress and move on. However, once taught those skills, they can move on r rather quickly. There's a certain program, um, Orton-Gillingham types of programs. It's a very specific mode of teaching that teaches uh, and with a multi-sensory component to it that, that the research, well, one of the only components or, or programs that the research supports for children with, with uh, Dyslexia, and they can be quite effective. Um, if parents are stri if if a parent has a child who has struggled for years with reading, writing, written expression, that type of thing, and they have not responded to other forms of treatment, and they continue to struggle, but they can feel free to give us a call, and we, and we can talk about that and talk about ways of overcoming that things that they probably haven't tried before. Very important topic because again, when, the, when these behavior issues happen, I'm sorry, when these academic issues happen over the course of time, they lead to behavior problems. They lead to low self-esteem. They lead to kids wanting to drop out. Kids not liking school anymore. And that's, uh, that, that hurts everybody. And so it doesn't have to be that way. All right, uh, new research, Dr. Lowenstein, <coughs> schizophrenia <coughs> and autism. Yes, there's some new research that has come out. Uh, it's the largest study uh, that's been reported that seems to uh, create a link between children born to a parent with diagnosed schizophrenia and other uh, mental health disorders having a child, uh, having an increased risk to giving birth to a child with autism. Uh, there's a study that was published in the May issue of Pediatrics in which they studied uh, 1,200 children in Sweden as between 1997 and 2003 and 30,000 children with autism matched for age and sex and uh, place of birth and study the correlation between a parent having been hospitalized for a serious a mental health problem and their developing uh, uh, and a child being born with autism and uh, they, um, the results are very statistically significant for there being a correlation between those two events occurring. Now that's not to say that they, there's a causative factor between the two, nor is it meant to imply that, um, that children with autism are always born to parents with uh, emotional problems, but that there is an increased risk factor for that being present. As, as to what that means in the future, it's hard to know, other than this is a risk factor that needs to be followed. All right. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with some of your questions right after this. If you have a question you'd like to email our doctors, log on to their website, cbcwecare.com. Stay with us. Is your child defiant at home? Do teachers say your child refuses to behave? If this sounds familiar and your family is in crisis, we can help. I'm Dr. Robert Lowenstein. And I'm Dr. John Carrasso. At Community Psychiatric Centers, we make it our mission to quickly and effectively diagnose and treat your child so your family doesn't have to spend months on a waiting list. Call us today for a free phone consultation. An early diagnosis and proper treatment can make a world of difference in your child's life. The Watson Institute, helping children, helping families reach full potential. 
This is my beautiful daughter, Emma, at Watson. She's learned to walk. She's not perfect. She's still a little wobbly, but she is walking. She's happy here, learning from teachers and therapists I admire who inspire me. It's all happening here in these classrooms, the Watson Institute, helping kids like Emma, helping families like ours reach full potential. Back to Community Psychiatric Centers presents a few final questions for our doctors. Uh, these are some of your email questions. All right, here we go. My first grade child is struggling with reading. He has been tutored privately, but has not progressed. I'm thinking of referring him to the school psychologist. Would that be a good idea? Certainly can't hurt. A school psychologist can do an evaluation to, to figure out if there are learning deficits and how severe they are, and then possibly uh, determine whether the, the child is eligible for, for what's, what's called special education services. That would provide the child with extra support and attention in a classroom setting in a small group instruction type of, the type of format. That can be, can, that can be beneficial, potentially. The, the, the challenge, though, as, I, as we talked about earlier, is that if a child has certain types of uh, academic difficulties, they may or may not be picked up during this evaluation process. For example, a uh, child with dyslexia that, that typically is not picked up di in terms of the actual diagnosis by a school psychologist. What they're looking for is whether the child has a learning disability or not. Has an educational classification to determine uh, for special education services. That's not diagnosing dyslexia or providing specific <coughs> treatment that can be helpful for dyslexia. <coughs> so again, two different things, two, two, two important points about that. All right, let's look at another <coughs> email. My child wants to return home after graduating from college. Is that a good or bad idea? I guess returning home meaning living in the same yeah. house. Yeah, well, you know, the, the research just came out s suggesting that um, that, that could <coughs> be a problem. Uh, mm -hmm. Keeping in mind that, that the research suggested that those children returning, those, those young adults returning home from college uh, and living at home thereafter were more likely to be depressed than those who did not. Which is rather interesting. And I suppose there's a natural order to things, uh, and that there's a certain expectation that kids are going to be more independent. And when that doesn't happen, maybe that produces some depression, uh, and so that 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 could be a problem. Okay, um, my child has been prescribed an antipsychotic medication. Does that mean he is actually psychotic, or are those medications also used for other purposes? Also, should I be concerned about the side effects like weight gain? Well, the answer is uh, no. Obviously, uh, an antipsychotic medication is not always used for psychosis. It's used in children for other um, kinds of symptoms, such as um, aggression. Particularly useful in children who have autism and they're aggressive. Also, with children with ADHD or oppositional disorders. Uh, um, um, However, once a child is placed on a medication, there are certain risks that the parents have to know about, such as the risk of increased weight, uh, increased um, cholesterol, or the lipid profile can raise, and these children need to be followed very closely for those conditions. All right, doctors, thank you so much for being with us, and thank you for watching. We will uh, see you again next week on Community Psychiatric Centers Presents. Good evening.